is here. Now, broadcasting from, from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. This is the best of the Mark Levin Show, where we honor our fallen heroes on this Memorial Day and every day. Just to show you the extent of contempt or jealousy for me and this program. Ron DeSantis tomorrow at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time will be doing his first radio interview exclusively here after his announcement. I don't know what he's going to announce, but he's actually told me. I think he's going to be on Fox TV at 8 p.m. Eastern, but he will be on this program at 8.30. Uh, so I just wanted you to be aware of that. <laughs> Isn't it funny, Mr. J? It's hilarious. We have, a, we have a former U.S. attorney the other day who announces that, based on his own experience, which is quite significant, um in Utah, that he would have already indicted the Bidens. <laughs> Crickets. I mean, not because, I mean, I, I didn't say it, he said it. Now, to show you the extent to which the Democrat judges and Democrat prosecutors really want to derail Trump, and they want to derail DeSantis, the party in the media, too. More on that later is uh, the, we have a judge in New York now, in another matter. Uh, Check that. The judge in the Alvin Bragg case, he has set the trial for March 25th next year, right in the middle of the presidential primary. So this phony case, right in the middle of the presidential primary, we have never seen anything like this. Ever. Ever. Then we have the, the rogue Democrat prosecutor in Atlanta who is rumored to bring charges any time from the end of July to mid-August, right around the first debate. Right around the first debate. Then we have uh, <coughs> Mr. Overturned on Appeal, Jack the Ripper Smith, he's hanging around and he will bring it at the most propitious time for the Democrats, his charges. I have no doubt he will. And I suspect what he's focused on, ladies and gentlemen, is wire fraud, given the fundraising that we heard about, uh, not that there's a violation of law, but that he's looking at it. Obstruction. And a variety of other counts, multiple, multiple felony counts, because this guy's completely out of control, and he doesn't give a damn. You New Yorkers, you remember Sheldon Silver, Mr. Producer? He was the Speaker of the Assembly of New York for about 117 years. You remember him? Well, his first conviction was substantially overturned, Substantially overturned. And you know who brought that case, America? Jack the Ripper Smith. The conviction of former Republican governor of Virginia, Bob McDonnell, was completely overturned by unanimous United States Supreme Court. The case he brought against John Edwards in North Carolina Or again, he tried to stretch the definition of various laws and so forth. The jury in that case found the defendant not guilty and also on several of the counts couldn't decide it was a hung jury. But the case was so pathetic, the Justice Department decided not to rebring it. But here's what he knows. Here's what he knows. Sheldon Silver was a Democrat with a Democrat jury. 
Bob McDonald, case brought against Bob McDonald, is in Northern Virginia with a substantially Democratic jury. But even more important, a judge who didn't understand the law. And of course, John Edwards in North Carolina. The problem here is Trump would be brought, it would be brought in a case in Washington, D.C. 93% Democrat votes. I mean, a fifth grader could bring a case like that. So you have to rely on a prosecutor who is virtuous, good temperament. And Jack the Ripper Smith is neither of those, as he's demonstrated. Remember Andrew Weissman? Remember that little nerd, that little freak, that little fraud? Andrew Weissman! Remember him? I'm doing the German Weissman. Well, he said the other day that he, Weissman, has been called a Doberman. But compared to Jack the Ripper Smith, he's a golden retriever. Did you know he said that, Mr. Producer? He's actually always been a Yorkie. A Yorkie. And I like Yorkies, but not as prosecutors. So we have that. Then I start to think about things. Can a president pardon himself? You see, Donald Trump has more reason now than anybody to run for president, except maybe Biden. If we ever got a good attorney general in there, I think the Biden family would be the the Gotti family of of politics, and uh, I don't mean to put down the Gotti family because Biden's much worse when it comes to these financial activities. I mean, Gotti was never president. Biden is, and he's bought and paid for by the communist Chinese. Seems to me, for the rest of us, that's a bigger deal. Now, that said, now, that said, Trump has more reason to run and not get out than any of the others. Because in a federal case, he does indeed have the power to pardon himself as any president has the power to pardon him or herself. Now you'll hear all the all those pseudo intellectuals, pseudo professors, pseudo lawyers, and jackasses alike who will say that's not true. But they should, for once in their lives, put aside their politics and look at the Constitution. Ilya Shapiro, who's a libertarian law professor, or was, by all accounts, highly reputable. No Trump fan. But he asked this question. As the Trump presidency draws to a close at the end of a couple of years ago, a question that came up periodically during his tenure it's now resurfaced. Can the President of the United States pardon himself? In their new book, After Trump Reconstructing the Presidency, Jack Goldsmith, head of the Office of Legal Counsel, the elite Justice Department unit, that's essentially the executive branch's legal conscience. Under President George W. Bush and Bob Bauer, White House Counsel, um, let's see, under uh, President Barack Obama, acknowledged that self pardons may be possible. But suggest, among other reforms, that Congress should also make clear that a self-pardon is not allowed and cannot be the basis for immunity from federal criminal investigation. Of course, they're both dead wrong. Mike Ludick, highly respected former Fourth Circuit judge, remember Mike, an OLC head under George H.W. Bush, recently argued against the availability of self-pardon in light of constitutional structure. Of course, Ludick has no idea what the hell he's talking about. They're both wrong. A president has the absolute right to pardon. There's no limitation in the federal, in the federal area. Absolute right. How do I know it? The Constitution provides no limitations. None whatsoever. All that Article 2, Section 2 says is the president, quote, shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment, unquote. 
That's all it says. It doesn't say he can't pardon himself or anything of the sort. So while Goldsmith and Bauer and Ludig, no doubt, spend hours and hours with a very sharp pencil sitting in their basements in their in their boxer shorts trying to figure out, oh, we've got to figure this out, much like this clown Lawrence tribe claiming the 14th Amendment somehow empowers the President of the United States to destroy the House of Representatives. There is no limitation. And as Shapiro writes, this discretionary authority is purposely broad because it serves as a check on fundamental injustices in other cases where the law is an ass. In that sense, presidents should use it more often. It also facilitates national healing after political crises. George Washington used the pardon power after the Whiskey Rebellion. Abraham Lincoln after the Civil War. Jimmy Carter for draft dodgers after Vietnam. And we have Stanford law professor, former federal judge Michael McConnell, has explained that two days before the Constitutional Convention approved the Constitution, a move to narrow the pardon power because, quote, the president himself may be guilty, unquote, failed. It failed, despite support from Mr. Constitution himself, James Madison. As James Wilson, who would become a member of the first Supreme Court and was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention from Pennsylvania, specifically Philadelphia. As he argued, if the president, quote, be himself a party to the guilt, he can be impeached. In other words, he can be impeached and potentially removed. But that's the only, the only power. So the framers expressly contemplated the use of the pardon to clear a criminal conspiracy of which the president is himself a part. But importantly, they needed to have this debate in the first place because unlike the British king, from whom they had just declared independence, the American president would be subject to legal process. But they considered impeachment to be a sufficient check on potential abuses. And they were smart, because can you imagine? We have a thousand prosecutors in this country. A thousand. We have about twelve to fourteen thousand elected chief prosecutors, prosecutors. And of course, we have 93 United States attorneys, in this case, under Biden, appointed by the opposition, the Democrats. Approved by the Senate, yes, but they could approve it even if every Republican said no. And so you could imagine a president would be subjected to the potential of criminalization particularly by a Democrat party like this. I want you to think about these things, why the framers were so brilliant and why we have people who pretend to be brilliant, holding high offices and other positions, who try to substitute their lack of wisdom for the framers' wisdom. Whether it's the budget deficit or whether it's the pardon clause. Presidents should be able to pardon himself. It's never happened because we've never seen anything like we've seen today with respect to the attacks on this president. It's unprecedented. Absolutely unprecedented. To be facing one federal prosecutor after another, one state or local prosecutor after another. You know, a friend of mine said to me today, who's sort of a Trump supporter, at least claims to be. And he said, you know, Trump brought this on himself. This is sort of the Bill Barr, Andy McCarthy argument. He brought these things on himself, the way he conducts himself. He brought criminal investigations on himself? Really? Brought impeachment on himself, too? Brought civil suits on himself, too? Tax investigations, too? I was very disappointed to hear this because it's preposterous. John Kennedy never faced anything like this. Lyndon Johnson, 
Joe Biden. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Now, I know you guys are worried. Federal Reserve staff said banking crises fallout could push the economy into recession this year. But you can do something about that. Learn how to protect the retirement you worked really hard for. I think a great way is to diversify with gold and specifically a gold IRA. That's right, physical gold in your IRA. My favorite gold IRA company is Augusta Precious Metals. You got to call these guys and learn how a gold IRA can help you. So if you've saved 100000 or more in a 401k or an IRA, call Augusta Precious Metals and get their ultimate guide to gold IRAs. Tell them Mark sent you, and they'll give you a free gold coin when you open a gold IRA. Call Augusta Precious Metals today, 877-4-GOLD-IRA. That's 877-4-GOLD-IRA. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions. Get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. What a great company. Now back to the best of Mark Levin. We honor those on Memorial Day who have given their lives to defend this nation. You know, I want to give credit where credit is due, which is my want anyway, to the Ford Motor Company which has decided that it is not going to scrap AM radio from its cars. Did you hear that, Mr. Producer? And uh, we want to salute them. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the AM band does not interfere with electric vehicles. Certainly not in any way that matters. So this is just the way, you know, people say, well, why, why would these corporations go after concert? They're called corporatists for a reason. And what's funny is, if I didn't coin that phrase or that term 20 years ago, I certainly renewed its, its use. Corporatists. That's what they are. Corporatists. They're not conservatives probably woke up these corporations w-o-k-e these corporations are probably full of wokesters i'll be right back now i know you guys are worried federal reserve staff said banking crises fallout could push the economy into recession this year but you can do something about that learn how to protect the retirement you worked really hard for i think a great way is to diversify with gold and specifically a gold ira That's right, physical gold in your IRA. My favorite gold IRA company is Augusta Precious Metals. You got to call these guys and learn how a gold IRA can help you. So if you've saved 100000 or more in a 401k or an IRA, call Augusta Precious Metals and get their ultimate guide to gold IRAs. Tell them Mark sent you, and they'll give you a free gold coin when you open a gold IRA. Call Augusta Precious Metals today, 877-4-GOLD-IRA. That's 877-4-GOLD-IRA. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions. Get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. What a great company. You're listening to the Memorial Day edition of the Best of the Mark Levin Show. You know, it's interesting uh, when um, Joe Biden and his ilk use that phrase extreme MAGA Republicans because it obviously works with focus groups and the phrase has been polled extreme MAGA Republicans what does MAGA stand for make America great again so Joe Biden is basically saying if you believe in making America great again you're an extremist And I'm actually not surprised by that, given the positions that the Marxist Democrats have taken and given their destruction of every corner of this country and every enterprise that has made this country great. So now you're an extremist if you believe in making America great again. Because they don't believe in America. They don't believe America ever was great. Who was it that said, how can you make America great again? It never was great. 
One of these Democrat politicians said it, I remember. Bernie Sanders agrees with that. The vast majority of Democrats on Capitol Hill believe it. Joe Biden believes it, even though he's, it was Cuomo. Andrew Cuomo. Andrew Cuomo? Of WABC fame? America was never great. Wow. Excuse me. I meant governor of New York? Wow. America was never so great. Don't you know? America? So extreme MAGA Republicans. So they admit you're an extremist if you believe in making America great again. Which Republicans do. Now, what do the Democrats stand for? Making America great again? Of course not. They hate the country. Now, I don't mean you rank-and-file Democrats, although I don't understand why you're still Democrats. But your party, officialdom, representatives, appointees, power brokers, media frauds, all of them, those Democrats... They don't believe America's great. It's why they push critical race theory. It's why they want to destroy the nuclear family. It's why they want borders wide open. They believe the rest of the world is great, and we're not. It's why they hate capitalism. That's why they push equity, as opposed to equality. And that's why so many of them are and have been and always will be on the public dole. Make America great again. Oh, you must be an extremist. No, no, I'm, I'm not an extremist. No, 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 you must be. You believe in MAGA. Everybody with the terms. It's like we're now national conservatives. Excuse me? National. Well, I'm a constitutional conservative. That has very specific meanings, you know. No, 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 you don't understand. We must put America first. Well, don't all conservatives believe that? Not rhinos and so forth. Neocons. I'm saying conservatives. It's the whole point. It's the whole point of my book, Liberty Tyranny. Yes, America comes first. That's it. That's the ideology. That's brand new. Oh, I can't wait, Mr. Producer. But that for another day. So extreme MAGA Republicans in the media there. Nobody ever explains what that means. And you know what's amazing to me? Joe Biden is the best they've got. Other than Robert Kennedy Jr. And what's her name? Williamson, who's uh, irrelevancy. Nobody is going to challenge Joe Biden. Now, look at, look at Joe Biden. He's obviously inflicted with a level of dementia. But beyond that, look, look, he's a completely failed president. He's a failed president in action. But they love the fact that he's pushed the nation hard left. They don't care if there's high interest rates, the border is open. Other countries are now moving towards the communist Chinese currency away from the dollar. They don't care. And by the way, if people are losing their jobs, how about that, Mr. Iger? Mr. Iger is on his third phase of firing employees. Look, doesn't bother me as long as he's firing the right ones. Oops, the wokesters. Anyway, uh, and it's too bad. But the Democrat Party, it's amazing. That they, at one side of their mouth, they hate the country and they make it known. And on the other side of the, their mouth, they pretend they're defending the country for democracy. Really? Oh, yes. Is that why Biden is conducting himself like a dictator? Oh, you don't understand. So they talk like Marxists. As many people do, even people who claim not to be. Even some neocons. Can I use that word, neocon? claim to be 
but are really not. Now, there was a great piece. Let me see if I can find it here. By, uh, I did find it. Look at that. By Alan Dershowitz in the Wall Street Journal the other day. And uh, I think Alan Dershowitz doesn't get the credit he deserves. I know a lot of people attack. Oh, he's a Democrat. This guy's come a long way, America. He's come a long way from when I remember him 40 years ago. He's more conservative than Mitt Romney. And it's in the Wall Street Journal. Elon Musk is right about George Soros. And he's not anti-Semitic either. And Dershowitz says the Hungarian-born billionaire has done more than anyone to turn Americans against Israel. Now, that's interesting because George Soros has done more than anybody to fund the Democrat Party and its various Marxist outposts. He really has. He's done an enormous amount to destroy our cities, in my view. Law and order. Elon Musk, writes Dershowitz, has been accused of anti-Semitism because of his criticism and mockery of George Soros. Mr. Soros is Jewish, Mr. Musk is not. But Mr. Musk stands falsely accused. Mr. Soros is an active participant in politics, and his Jewishness shouldn't shield him from criticism. Further, no single person has done more damage to Israel standing in the world, especially among so-called progressives, than George Soros. His financial support has multiplied the influence of the two major organizations that have done the most to to shift the left-wing paradigm against Israel. One of them is Human Rights Watch, which was founded by publisher and human rights advocate Robert Bernstein, who lived from 1923 to 2019. For years, Human Rights Watch critiqued the denial of human rights by all countries based on two criteria. The seriousness of the violations in any particular nation, the inability of the nation's citizens to protest and remedy such violations. But in 1993, Kenneth Roth became executive director and turned it into an organization that specialized in demonizing Israel. Now, Roth is Jewish. Just like Soros is Jewish. By 2009... The Israel bashing had become so severe that Bernstein wrote, as the founder of Human Rights Watch, its active chairman for 20 years and now founding chairman emeritus. I must do something that I never anticipated. I must publicly join the group's critics. So this guy founds Human Rights Watch. He's an old man at this point, and he starts trashing it, saying it's been turned into a monster. Human Rights Watch had as its original mission to pry open closed societies, advocate basic freedoms, and support dissenters. But recently it's been issuing reports on the Israeli-Arab conflict that are helping those who wish to turn Israel into a pariah state. That's what he wrote about his own group. Mr. Roth has deployed human rights as a weapon against Israel. His organization's one-sided reports were used to justify selected condemnation of Israel by the U.N., and its divisions. They were circulated on university campuses and around the world. And despite their obvious and anti-Israel biased supporters pointed to Mr. Roth's Jewish heritage to lend credibility to his anti-Israel accusations. I call these people self-hating Jews, as you well know. And you have them in all ethnicities, all walks of life. Here's an organization created by the goodwill of the free world to fight violations of human rights, which has become a tool in the hands of dictatorial regimes to fight against democracies, observed Natan Sharansky, the former Soviet dissident, an Israeli Knesset member in 2009. It's time to call a spade a spade, he said. The real activity of this organization today is a far cry from what it was set up 30 years ago to do, throw light in dark places where there's really no other way to find out what's happening regarding human rights. In 2010, Mr. Soros said he planned to give $100 million, quote, the largest gift by far that Human Rights Watch has ever received, the New York Times reported. The paper quoted Mr. Soros, quote, every Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock, 
A group at Human Rights Watch got together and discussed issues with the managers, he said. I was an active participant in that group, and the human rights remains an important element of my foundation's current activities. The other organization is J Street. Despite its claim to be a progressive pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian organization, J Street has done much to turn most progressives and some liberal Democrats, including members of Congress, academics, and media figures, against Israel. Last year, Haaretz, an Israeli newspaper, reported that Mr. Soros contributed $1 million to J Street Super PAC, quote, 20 times larger than any previous donation J Street Action Fund received. I'm not the only Jewish American to criticize Mr. Soros, writes Alan Dershowitz. In a January article by the Jewish News Service, Farley Weiss, a former president of the National Council of Young Israel, wrote, Soros' defenders try to shut down criticism of the billionaire by claiming it's anti-Semitic because Soros himself is Jewish. But no one has financed more destructive attacks on Israel and the American Jewish community than Soros. Mr. Soros also had, has had a pernicious influence on American domestic issues, such as funding leftist candidates for district attorney, who have politicized law enforcement. And unlike Mr. Musk, says Dershowitz, I haven't compared Mr. Soros to Magneto, a Marvel supervillain who, like Mr. Soros, survived the Holocaust. I wouldn't make that comparison because I never heard of Magneto. By the way, neither had I. But I agree with Mr. Musk. That Mr. Soros' acts contribute to fraying the, quote, fabric of civilization, unquote. And Mr. Musk has shown no hostility toward Israel or the Jewish people. Some right-wing anti-Semites, he said, have focused on Mr. Soros in promoting anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about the Jews controlling the world. Critics of Mr. Soros should join supporters in condemning such misuse of Jewish heritage. But this misuse shouldn't deter legitimate criticism of the malign influence Mr. Soros has on the world, irrespective of his being Jewish. He's had a horrific influence on this country, has Soros. And why did I bother going through all this with you, America? Because Mr. Soros is rooting for Joe Biden for president. Mr. Soros is a big funder of the Democrat Party. Mr. Soros has an enormous influence, which he's purchased with his multi-billions of dollars. On the left, Bernie Sanders is the kind of Jew that George Soros is. I would even argue Chuck Schumer is. But George Soros hates America, hates Israel, is worth tens of billions of dollars. But if you raise any questions about George Soros, you are attacked as an anti-Semite by the Democrat Party media, the Democrat Party, and the Democrats. And so I am asking tonight something that will never happen. Will Joe Biden condemn George Soros? Yes or no? The answer is no. How about Schumer? No. How about Pelosi? No. How about any Jewish Democrat in Congress? No. Any more than any black Democrat in Congress, other than the Republicans, will condemn Louis Farrakhan. No. Extreme MAGA Republicans, America, coming out of the mouth of Joe Biden, who was a racist, segregationist. When he started his career, pretended to be a civil rights activist. He's such a damn liar. And now he's out there with extreme MAGA Republicans, the party of Soros. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Now, I know you guys are worried. Federal Reserve staff said banking crises fallout could push the economy into recession this year. But you can do something about that. Learn how to protect the retirement you worked really hard for. I think a great way is to diversify with gold and specifically a gold IRA. That's right. Physical gold in your IRA. My favorite gold IRA company is Augusta Precious Metals. You got to call these guys and learn how a gold IRA can help you. So if you've saved 100000 or more in a 401k or an IRA, 
Call Augusta Precious Metals and get their ultimate guide to gold IRAs. Tell them Mark sent you, and they'll give you a free gold coin when you open a gold IRA. Call Augusta Precious Metals today, 877-4-GOLD-IRA. That's 877-4-GOLD-IRA. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions. Get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. What a great company. Now back to the best of Mark Levin. We honor those on Memorial Day who have given their lives to defend this nation. Turns out the chairman and CEO of the NAACP lives in Florida. Do you know that, Mr. Producer? Yeah. He doesn't live in Chicago. You know, Derek Hunter has a great piece at Town Hall. It's titled, Yes, Democrats, Stay Out of Florida. Democrats seem to labor under the delusion that the rest of us long to spend time with them. That we'd be lost without their nagging or just their smell. <laughs> when, there are <laughs> when there are long stretches of time without some Karen screaming about how you should wear a mask at the park or use whatever pronouns they or their kid decided they felt like on that day, no one misses them. Life is better without all of them. So when you see groups from the Alphabet Mafia, the NAACP, the LGBTQ, RSTUV, WXYZ community, etc., telling fellow leftists to stay out of somewhere, I say, great, stay the hell out. I don't care where black people or gay people or anyone chooses to vacation or move. I'm not vacationing or moving with you, so what does it matter to me? I'm sure you're not emotionally or otherwise invested in my family's latest trip, trip to the beach because I didn't receive either a phone call or a check, and I'm as equally disinterested in everyone else's moves. That being said, when gay groups and the NAACP issued travel warnings about going to Florida, made me want to go there more. The NAACP is 114 years old. That time they did some amazing and important work, but that time is long over. They defeated the Democrat Party, then became the Democrat Party by embracing the concept of segregation as a bastardized form of tolerance. They did so for the same reason every group of that sort ultimately shifts from fighting for equality to fighting for equity, and that is money. And it goes on about the NAACP and so forth and so on. Oh, well. We'll be right back. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. He's here. He's here. Now broadcasting from the underground command post... Deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. This is the best of the Mark Levin Show, where we honor our fallen heroes on this Memorial Day and every day. Want to have some more fun? Let's have some more fun. Many of you are in your cars or trucks, buses, the dinner table, millions and millions of you across the country. Very exciting. Michael Gerson, the late Michael Gerson, I'm looking at Liberty and Tyranny, which so many of you have read. He was the formerly the chief speechwriter for President George W. Bush, and he wrote a book called Heroic Conservatism. And he said, if Republicans run in future elections with a simplistic anti-government message, ignoring the poor, the addicted, and children at risk, they will lose and they will deserve to lose. So Gerson argued for a compassionate conservatism and faith-based initiatives in which the federal government plays a central role. This was Bush's guy at the time. And then William Crystal and David Brooks, they used to both work for The Standard, a magazine that has since destroyed itself. 
And they promoted something called, and they did it repeatedly, national greatness conservatism. Which also involved a significant role for the central government. It seems to me if you're going to come up with a new idea, which isn't really a new idea for a philosophy, you shouldn't call it national conservatism. You got the rhinos using the phraseology, and then you have others, like national socialists fill in the blank. The great thing about America is that it wasn't founded by a national government. It wasn't founded by a national anything. There were these disparate colonies that came together. They formed a federal government with very, very limited powers. And of course, they spelled it out in the Constitution. All these departments that exist today, all these departments that exist today, some of the functions existed, but for instance, the Department of Justice did not exist. It was created by Ulysses S. Grant. But an attorney general, a leading attorney general, goes back some time. Same with the Secretary of State. Secretary of the Treasury. Yes, there was one. And there was a Secretary of State. And um, they did what they could to separate powers, balance powers, and all the rest of it. But there is this apparently irresistible urge, even among pseudo-conservatives for much, much more centralized power to do something that they want done. Maybe it's to go after the private sector or whatever it is. That is, outside outside the boundaries placed in the Constitution. So in many ways, there are no more constitutionalists as the Marxists left. They just have some different ideas. So it seems to me if they have different ideas, they have to defend them. Because why should we support them otherwise? Now, in liberty and tyranny, we're going to have fun. This is fun, isn't it? I say on faith in the founding, reason cannot by itself explain why there is reason. Science cannot by itself explain why there is science. Man's discovery and application of science are products of reason. Reason and science can explain the existence of matter, but they cannot explain why there is matter. They can explain the existence of the universe, but they cannot explain why there is a universe. They can explain the existence of nature and the laws of physics, but they cannot explain why there is nature and the law of physics. They can explain the existence of life, but they cannot explain why there is life. They can explain the existence of consciousness, but they cannot explain why there is consciousness. Science is a critical aspect of human existence, but it cannot address the spiritual nature of man. In this respect, science is a dead end around which the atheist refuses to reason. Reason itself informs man of its own limitations and in doing so directs him to the discovery of a force greater than himself. A supernatural force responsible for the origins of not only human existence, but all existence and which itself has always existed and will always exist. For most, the supernatural reveals itself in the Creator, God. Man seeks God's guidance through faith and prayer. The agnostic accepts the supernatural, but is not so sure of the form of its existence. The deist accepts that God created the universe in a man's condition, but left it to man to sort things out through reason. Man is more than a physical creature. As Edmund Burke argued, each individual is created as a unique spiritual being with a soul and a conscience. It is bound to a transcendent moral order established by divine providence, uncovered through observation and experience over the ages. Quote, here's what he wrote. There is but one law for all, namely the law which governs all law, the law of our creator, the law of humanity, justice, equity, the law of nature, and of nations. 
And I add, this is the natural law that penetrates man's being and which the Founding Fathers adopted as the principle around which civilized American society would be organized. The Founders were enlightened men, but not men purely of the Age of Enlightenment. They were highly educated, well-informed men who excelled at reason and subscribed to science, but worshipped neither. They comprehended them. The, their strengths as well as weaknesses. The Declaration of Independent Signers were Congregationalist, Presbyterian, Anglican, Unitarian, Roman Catholic. At least two founders, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, are widely believed to have been deists. But they were men of varying degrees of denominations, but not, but, excuse me, but united and emphatic in the belief that the Creator was the origin of their existence and the source of their reason. Is it possible that there is no natural law and man can know moral order and unalienable rights from his own reasoning, unaided by the supernatural or God? Now there are, of course, those who argue this case, including the atheist and others who attempt to distinguish natural law from divine providence. It is not the view adopted by the Founders. This position would, it seems, lead man to arbitrarily create his own morality and rights or create his own arbitrary morality and rights. Right and wrong, just and unjust, good and bad, would be relative concepts susceptible to circumstantial applications. Moreover, by what justification would life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness be unalienable rights if there is no natural law, since reason alone cannot make them invaluable? What then is natural law if its origin is unknown or rejected? It is nothing more than a human construct under those circumstances. An individual may benefit from the moral order and unalienable rights around which society functions while rejecting their divine origin. That's my point is that a lot of people who are disbelievers, that's fine. But that's not what the nation is. They can function within this society. But the society wouldn't exist but for this moral order given by God. The civil society cannot organize organize itself that way. It would become unstable, vulnerable to anarchy and tyranny, imperiling all within it, especially the individual. The abandonment of natural law is the adoption of tyranny in one form or another because there is no humane or benevolent alternative to natural law. That's just the chapter on faith in the founding. What about free <coughs> What about free markets? Do we like free markets? If not, what do we like? The Marxist doesn't like free markets. The fascist doesn't like free markets. The economic socialist doesn't like free markets. Do you? For the most part? That's coming under vicious attack. I think by the NatCons and maybe others. I could be wrong. We'll learn more next week. The free market is the most transformative of economic systems. It fosters creativity and inventiveness. Produces new industries, products, and services as it improves upon existing ones. With millions of individuals freely engaged in an infinite number and variety of transactions every day, it's impossible to even conceive all the changes and plans for changes occurring in our economy at any given time. The free market creates more wealth and opportunities for more people than any other economic model. But the conservative believes that the individual is more than a producer and consumer of material goods. He exists within the larger context of the civil society, which provides for an ordered liberty. The conservative sees in the free market the harmony of interests and rules of cooperation that also underlie the civil society. For example, the free market promotes self-worth, self-sufficiency, shared values, and honest dealings, which enhance the individual, the family, and the community. It discriminates against no race, religion, or gender. The truck driver does not know the skin color of the individuals who produce the diesel fuel for his vehicle. The cook does not know the religion of the dairy farmer who supplies milk to his restaurant. 
And the airline passenger does not know the gender of the factory workers who manufactured the commercial aircraft that transports them, nor do they care. But you see, folks, under other systems, they do care. They mandate. They ban. And so forth and so on. When we look when the government gets involved, you see colossal disasters for the most part. The Community Reinvestment Act of 1977 completely destroyed the home financing and housing market. Killed it. Destroyed many families. Forced many families to lose their homes. Destroyed Freddie Mae and Fannie Mac and everything that they invested in in terms of loans. And of course... Savings and loans, they went under. In addition to your own problems that cost the country hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. So nobody's saying there shouldn't be, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter, regulations. Even Adam Smith said there should be taxes, there should be regulations. But taxes and regulations that are intended for the actual purposes of government and the civil society not to redistribute wealth, not to subsidize industries, not to create monopolies and oligopolies. And one of the great things about America, said de Tocqueville, was the decentralization of government meant that these thousands and thousands of the villages and towns and counties and cities would make decisions for themselves. And mobility enabled people to move from one to the other, should they wish to. I don't have all day, so let me keep going. Immigration. The statist argument, I argue, for comprehensive immigration reform reduces to this. America is a nation of immigrants. The founding and settling of the nation came about because of immigrants who braved dangers to come to this country and risked everything to build the prosperity we enjoy today. Now certainly this is true as far as it goes. Of course, to say this is a nation of immigrants is to say every nation is a nation of immigrants. Mexico, the source of most immigrants to the United States today, is a nation of Spanish and other immigrants. The implication is, however, that both legal and illegal immigration, no matter how extensive, is another moral imperative justifying the transformation of the civil society. This is not so. Once again, the Declaration of Independence provides guidance on this issue. It states in relevant part that to secure these unalienable rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. It is the right of the people to alter or abolish the government and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Have the governed, that is we, the American people, consented to the current state of legal and illegal immigration in the nation? Do current immigration policies and enforcement practices affect the safety and happiness of the people? Of course. No society can withstand the unconditional mass migration of aliens from every corner of the earth. The preservation of the nation's territorial sovereignty and the culture, language, mores, traditions, and customs that make possible a harmonious community of citizens dictate that citizenship be granted only by the consent of the governed, not by the unilateral actions or demands of the alien, and then only to aliens who will throw off their allegiance to their former nation and society and pledge their allegiance to America. The historical basis for making immigration decisions has been radically altered. The emphasis is no longer on the preservation of American society and the consent of the governed. Now aliens themselves decide who comes to the United States through, among among other means, family reunification. There's more, and I want to get to more, from Liberty and Tyranny. I have to dust off the book. Well, some of the new generation, ladies and gentlemen, they pronounce themselves as new. Probably have never read the book. If they did, they haven't retained it. Um, 
They probably don't know much about what came before. Don't merely give a damn. So a lot of very, very old people who came before. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Jesus, so many others. But the newbies know everything. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Remember the last time you got a quote-unquote free phone? You started out feeling great, then came the hefty activation fees, four-line requirements, and of course, the binding contract. Don't fall for it again, folks. Only Pure Talk gives you a free 5G Samsung Galaxy phone without the feeling you've been duped. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data plan with Mobile Hotspot for just 55 bucks a month and get a 5G Samsung Galaxy for free. That's right, unlimited everything at a fraction of the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Here's another thing. You'll be on America's most dependable 5G network. How do I know? I'm a customer. Make the switch to Pure Talk, the wireless company I'm proud to stand behind, because they're proud to stand behind me and you. Just dial pound 250 and say Mark Levin, and you'll get a free Samsung Galaxy when you sign up for unlimited talk, text, and unlimited data. Again, go to puretalk.com, use promo code Levin Podcast, L-E-V-I-N Podcast, to start saving today. You're listening to the Memorial Day edition of the Best of the Mark Levin Show. I only have a minute, and there's only a little more that I want to get to, because I can't read the whole book to you. One of the things I regret is really the lack of a strong farm team right now. I don't know if it's due to universities and colleges. I just don't know. Uh, But... There are some outstanding young men and women. There's no question about it, but there's not enough. There's wannabes. There's people who try to position themselves. And they seem to think, it's the same with talk radio, that trashing another guy is going to get them where they want to go. It's not going to happen. And I will put this marker down, and you'll have to read between the lines. As a father and a husband... I will not tolerate anyone who tries to destroy the reputation, the character, and the integrity of any member of my family. Not now, not ever. That's exactly what Josh Hawley was writing about. I'll be right back. Remember the last time you got a quote-unquote free phone? You started out feeling great, then came the hefty activation fees, four-line requirements, and of course, the binding contract. Don't fall for it again, folks. Only Pure Talk gives you a free 5G Samsung Galaxy phone without the feeling you've been duped. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data plan with Mobile Hotspot for just 55 bucks a month and get a 5G Samsung Galaxy for free. That's right, unlimited everything at a fraction of the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Here's another thing. You'll be on America's most dependable 5G network. How do I know? I'm a customer. Make the switch to Pure Talk, the wireless company I'm proud to stand behind, because they're proud to stand behind me and you. Just dial pound 250 and say Mark Levin, and you'll get a free Samsung Galaxy when you sign up for unlimited talk, text, and unlimited data. Again, go to puretalk.com, use promo code Levin Podcast, L-E-V-I-N Podcast, to start saving today. Now back to the best of Mark Levin. We honor those on Memorial Day who have given their lives to defend this nation. I have never preached that America shouldn't get involved in every war, in every battle, in every corner of the earth. That would be stupid. Forever wars, they call them, I suppose. It's hard to know how long a war is going to last before they end. The Revolutionary War was a forever war, I suppose. But that doesn't mean you don't believe in national security and intervention when the time is right. And what word best defines what our national security and our defense and military posture should be? What one word 
If you read Liberty and Tyranny, Chapter 10, you know. What is it? Prudence. It's not an ideological thing when it comes to the security of the United States. Prudence. And so Chapter 10 is entitled Self-Preservation. Not defense, not national security. In liberty and tyranny, it's entitled self-preservation. That's the goal. The conservative believes that the moral imperative of all public policy must be the preservation and improvement of American society. So I love it when I'm lectured about this. Because I wrote about it almost 20 years, whenever it was. Similarly, the object of American foreign policy must be no different. The founders recognized that America had to be strong politically, economic, culturally, and yes, militarily, to survive and thrive in a complex, ever-changing global environment, not only in their time, but for all time. History bears this out. After the Revolutionary War, the founders realized that the Confederation was inadequate to conduct foreign affairs, since each state was free to act on its own. There could be no coherent national security policy because There was no standing army, and each state ultimately was responsible for its own defense. The nation's economy was vulnerable to pirates who were terrorizing transatlantic shipping routes, and by the way, taking the men who worked on those ships into slavery and bringing them into the central part of Africa. And of course, the British and Spanish empires were looming threats. The authority of the national government to raise and maintain a standing army and use military power within the framework of a Republican system was among the first matters addressed by the framers when they presented the Finnish Constitution to the states for ratification. And after reviewing a litany of European interests and conflicts in North America, John Jay in Federalist Fourth wrote, he would become the first Chief Justice. Listen carefully. The people of America are aware that inducements to war may arise out of these circumstances, as well as from others, not so obvious at present, and that whenever such inducements may find fit time and opportunity for operation, pretenses to color and justify them will not be wanting. In other words, there will be times we have to go to war. And we don't always know when or how these situations are going to present themselves. So he goes on in Federalist 4. Wisely, therefore, do they consider union and a good national government as necessary to put and keep them in such a situation as instead of inviting war, will tend to repress and discourage it. Build up your forces strong enough so you don't provoke the enemy. The situation consists in the best possible state of defense. And necessarily depends on the government and the arms and the resources of the country. Indeed, one of the stated purposes of the Constitution is, quote, to protect for the common defense. Well, where does that get us? Few knew better than Washington that America must establish alliances that have as their purpose the protection and well-being of the nation. Without the crucial material aid and military support of France and other nations, the decisive battle of Yorktown, perhaps the Revolutionary War itself, might have been lost. Washington was neither an isolationist nor an interventionist. Yes, he was skeptical of alliances. But when in America's best interests, he made them. Washington preferred diplomacy to war. But he knew war was sometimes unavoidable. And by word and deed... As general, president, and statesman, Washington spent his public life pursuing the preservation and improvement of the American society. Washington's example is what? Flexibility in the means to achieve the immutable and the immutable end, which is the national security of the United States. And again, the word is not conservative or liberal in this context. It's not not con. Or what is this other one he sees? Boomer con. What the hell that is. But nonetheless, it's prudence. Prudence is the word. 
Certainly, America cannot export democracy everywhere simultaneously, nor, nor should it attempt to. For one thing, it is impractical. There are cultures and regimes that are not receptive to such overtures. Also, the loss of American lives and the enormous financial costs in chasing such unrealistic ends would threaten the preservation and improvement of American society. It would demoralize the population and desensitize it to real threats that endanger the society. However, there are occasions when democracy building is prudent. For example, the European Recovery Program, better known as the Marshall Plan of 1948, had among its purposes the promotion and preservation of democracy through the provision of of billions of dollars in economic and military aid to several European nations defeated in World War II. See, we learned the lesson after World War I, which was, okay, we destroyed these countries, now let's walk away. And then we got World War II. We got Hitler in particular. Among other things, it would and did help repel the spread of Soviet communism through what remained of free Europe, which was clearly in America's interests. And more recently, you can talk about other areas of the world as well. Now, the conservative believes that unalienable rights attach to all human beings, but it is not necessarily the responsibility of the United States to enforce those rights. How can it be? However, he also believes that there are times when evil perpetrated by a regime is so horrific that to ignore it tears at the moral core of American civil society. You can see this with the Holocaust and things of that sort. Though there can be no single doctrine that defines the elements of action or inaction in every case, once again, prudence must dictate if and when the cost of American lives and treasure is worth intervention on these grounds. The conservative does not seek rigid adherence to any specific course of action. Neutrality or alliance, preemptive war or defensive posture, nation building or limited military strikes. The benchmark, again, is whether any specific path will serve the nation's best interests. It's difficult to imagine a theory under which a society could otherwise survive. And so even though agreements on Russia versus Ukraine and so forth, the disagreement, I don't think, is in the application of prudence in trying to determine what is or is not in America's best interest. I think the difference is in the outcome. As I said before, Clarence Thomas and Antonin Scalia, originalists looking at the Constitution, applying the same level of textual adherence and historical adherence and coming up with a different result. And at that point, you're left with persuasion. Persuasion. But what I'm finding, ladies and gentlemen, is this. Among these, well, backbenchers, I guess, if you don't agree with them, they want to go to war with you. In other words, I can't believe he came up with that conclusion. I used to think he was so good. That is the difference between the new generation and the older generation. They're so, they're so passe. They're so Reagan. And of course, these are the mumblings of uh, low IQ individuals. Now for the statist, that is the Marxist, foreign policy is another opportunity to enhance his own authority at the expense of the civil society. So we understand that. Several elements I wrote back then of Barack Obama's global vision needed to be addressed when he says the security of the American people is inextricably linked to the security of all people. What is meant by security of all people of the world? How in every case is America's security related to their security? It's clearly not. And if a regime refuses to secure for its people that which America believes it should, what then? Moreover, are there not times when the security of other people conflicts with the security of America? Obama said, and Americans must lead by reaching out to all those living disconnected lives of despair in the world's forgotten corners. What does it mean to live a disconnected life of despair? 
If included among the disconnected, for example, are the millions of starving people living under the iron fist of North Korea and their communist regime. What do we do about that? Americans are supposed to reach out to them, but disconnected lives of despair appears to mean much more than denial of liberty to people in forgotten corners of the world. To Obama, it's a messianic attitude that has no basis in reality. So you see, from my perspective, this is why I challenged John McCain and our friend, often Marco Rubio and others, but more McCain and more Lindsey Graham. You see, the choice isn't between either you agree with us or you must be a neocon. No. That's stupidity. Obama. But if the next president can restore the American people's trust, if they know that he or she is acting with their best interests at heart, uh, with prudence and wisdom and some measure of humility, then I believe the American people will be ready to see America lead again. And so I ask, how would this restore the American people's trust? And in whom and in what? How is committing them to a staggeringly unrealistic global task acting in their best interests? Where is the prudence and wisdom in such a reckless overstatement of human possibilities, which completely ignores history and man's experience? No. And so it goes on. And, of course, in the same chapter, I warn strongly against surrendering to international governing organizations. Again, this is from Liberty and Tyranny. When did this come out? I think it's 2005, something like that, Mr. Producer. I'm looking at the copyright bead right now, if I can find it. But you folks, many of you had it. Uh, 2009. So it came out, uh, actually was finished 15 years ago. It takes time to publish it. So the choice isn't this stark, well, uh, if you don't agree with me about Russia or Ukraine, then obviously you're a neocon. You don't agree with me about abandoning NATO, well, then obviously you're a rhino. You know, that's Mickey Mouse stuff and bad Mickey Mouse stuff. The old days, not the old days, Mickey Mouse, the modern days. I'll be back. Mark Lovin. Remember the last time you got a quote unquote free phone? You started out feeling great, then came the hefty activation fees, four line requirements, and of course the binding contract. Don't fall for it again, folks. Only Pure Talk gives you a free 5G Samsung Galaxy phone without the feeling you've been duped. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data plan with Mobile Hotspot for just 55 bucks a month and get a 5G Samsung Galaxy for free. That's right, unlimited everything at a fraction of the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Here's another thing. You'll be on America's most dependable 5G network. How do I know? I'm a customer. Make the switch to Pure Talk, the wireless company I'm proud to stand behind, because they're proud to stand behind me and you. Just dial pound 250 and say Mark Levin, and you'll get a free Samsung Galaxy when you sign up for unlimited talk, text, and unlimited data. Again, go to puretalk.com, use promo code Levin Podcast, L-E-V-I-N Podcast, to start saving today. You're listening to the Memorial Day edition of the Best of the Mark Levin Show. History is important, even recent history. When I wrote Liberty and Tyranny, which I just read from you, it came out simultaneously with the Tea Party movement. You might remember that famous picture of Sarah Palin holding it under her arm. And it became the Thomas Paine pamphlet for the movement, one and a half million copies sold. When I wrote Liberty and Tyranny, Our friends at Convention of States just launched Convention of States. I had no idea that Meckler had launched it. And together with that book, and he'll tell you that, and that organization, we created another liberty revolution. With uh, American Marxism, that book came out slightly before the parents' movement, but embraced it and explained it. 
and I think participated in launching that movement. And at Landmark Legal Foundation, so many great lawyers there and so many great other groups. We helped launch and litigate it all the way to the Supreme Court, the school choice movement, which was under attack by the teachers union and so forth and so on. So for the Lilliputians who wish to climb the ladder, do it the hard way. Do it the hard way. Try and improve your country. Try and contribute to your country. Get off of social media. Stop patting yourself on the back. Seminars are fine, but they're not all that they're said to be. And get off your fat ass and do something. That's how you try and make a difference. And I've been able to use this microphone and TV to advance those causes as well. But most of all, because of you, this fantastic audience in radio, radio more than anywhere else, 20 years I've been here thanks to you. You, Levinites, patriots, people in this audience, you've done all of this and a thousand times more. I don't take you for granted, trust me. And don't forget this Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern. You don't want to miss it. DVR it if you can't watch it live. 8 p.m. Sunday Eastern. I'll be back. He's here. He's here. Now broadcasting from the underground command post. Deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. This is the best of the Mark Levin Show, where we honor our fallen heroes on this Memorial Day and every day. Joe Biden uh, put out a, well, his people put out a statement. I just concluded a productive meeting with Speaker McCarthy about the need to prevent, default, and avoid a a catastrophe for our economy. We reiterated once again that default is off the table, and the only way to move forward is in good faith toward a bipartisan agreement. While there are areas of disagreement with the Speaker and I and his lead negotiators, Chairman McHenry and Chairman Graves and our staffs will continue to discuss the path forward. So, in other words, we don't know what the hell's going on. Isn't that the long and the short of it, Mr. Producer? Yes, indeed, America. So, there we have it. And uh, Tim Scott is announced for president, as you may know. So, he is immediately attacked by the morons on The View, of course. And it's really this Sonny Houston. She's got a hate on her like you cannot imagine. She and her husband and her family live in this massive estate. It's worth millions. Only in America. Only in America can people with no talent, none, be able to use our capitalist system and become enormously wealthy. The lap of luxury in the country, not just in the country, in the whole world, And then trash everything and everyone around them. Then you know. Then you know. That people are spoiled rotten. And the people on The View are spoiled rotten. Because they're largely stupid people. Who have no substance. And certainly within the last 10 years have accomplished absolutely nothing. And of course their contributions to the country are zero. What has Karen Goldberg contributed to the country? Nothing. How about Sonny Houston? What has she contributed to the country? Nothing. How about the other adults there? And then that What has she contributed to the country? A lot of methane, I think, Mr. Producer. That's about it. And yet they're out there, they're on the attack, man. And if you don't fall in line, like Tim, Con- uh, Tim Scott is a wonderful person. There's no reason to attack him. You may have noticed he's a black man and he's a Republican. And you see, that's the problem. It doesn't even matter what his views are. According to them. 
here is Sonny Houston. Cut 19, go. After the police shootings in... Oh, this um, is, uh, first of all, it's Anna Navarro. Now, she in particular should be bowing at the feet of capitalism and freedom in this country because she is a certified moron in more than one language, I may add. Cut 19, go. After the police shootings in, um, in, uh, against African Americans in 2016, he did some speeches on the Senate floor mm-hmm. that were incredibly impactful about what it's like to live in America, what it's like to live in the South. Let's remember, he's from South Carolina, in the skin of a but black he man. He ignores systemic racism. Yeah. He no, pretends but, that it's... But what I'm saying, saying to you is that they're not hearing it from Tim Scott, they're not hearing it, period. I think it, so at least he's adding that. I think that. one of the issues that Tim Scott um, has is that he seems to think because I made it, Everyone can make it, ignoring, again, the fact that he is the exception and not the rule. And until he is the rule, then he can stop talking about systemic racism. There you go. And you know what? Sorry, uh, Anna Navarro, you were actually good here. And so I will salute you on this one occasion. But you see, if I'm wrong, I correct myself. It's so infrequent. But nonetheless, I will. But listen to this, Sonny Houston. He ignores systemic racism in America. Hi, Mr. Producer, I want you to contact her people at The View and ask her to come on the program where we can have a short discussion about America and racism. Okay? I'm quite serious. None of these people will come on the show, so maybe she will. And the Clarence Thomas syndrome. Look at the hatred. Look at the hatred. That's why the view only exists because what is it? ABC syndicates it, Mr. Producer? Something like that. So, in other words, ABC, one of the major corporations in the world, I guess it's, is it still part of uh, Disney? I guess it is. So it's the same corporate environment. And so these people at ABC and Disney, they provide a platform like this. These are haters. These are nasty people. It's like over at MSNBC. They're provided a platform by Comcast, who rips you off every month. By Comcast. And uh, they, 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 they bring us the Joy Reeds of the world. There's nothing joyful about Joy Reed. She's a nut. In fact, she's worse than a nut. She's a bigot, in my uh, humble opinion. And she's not the only one over there. I mean, who would give a platform to the Scarboroughs? What do you think, Mika? Oh, I'm with you, Joe. Oh, okay. As they broadcast out of there facilities in Jupiter, but and that's okay, I've done that a lot. But they pretend they're not. That's the difference. But look how they trash this guy, Tim Scott. This is this is what we have to deal with. You know, this is us. We here he is in North Carolina, excuse me, in the North Charleston, South Carolina, at a rally today. Cut seventeen, go. I have lived that the closest thing to magic in America is a good education. But today, the far left has us retreating away from excellence in schools. Extreme liberals are letting big labor bosses trap millions of kids in failing schools. They're replacing education with indoctrination. They spent COVID locking kids out of the classroom And now they're locking kids out of their futures. And in Biden's America, crime is on the rise and law enforcement is in retreat. The far left is ending cash bails. They're demonizing, demoralizing, and defunding the police. I grew up in neighborhoods alongside people who ended up incarcerated or in the seminary. Cemetery, not seminary. Seminary too, but cemetery as well. (laughs) We needed more public safety, 
not less. We cannot have innocent people at risk, police officers getting ambushed and attacked, and seniors locked in their homes from the time the sun goes down until the sun comes up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's going to be formidable in, in the sense that uh, he speaks about these things from a position of experience. And so they're going to start gunning for him. They're going to they're going to put the real hate on him. You know, the way they do our buddy Clarence Thomas and others who simply won't toe the line. Cut 18, go. Joe Biden and the radical left are attacking every single rung of the ladder that helped me climb. And that's why I'm announcing today that I'm running for president of the United States of America. (laughs) It's exciting, isn't it? Isn't that exciting, Mr. Producer? He's really a good guy. Really a good guy. Very nice man. We'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Now back to the best of Mark Levin. We honor those on Memorial Day who have given their lives to defend this nation. Michelle Obama, you're out there still? Yes, yes. You talk about a grifter. Now, maybe from time to time she'll do charitable work in between her many, many business activities. You know, she's a massively successful author. Oh, yeah. Sure, she's written her own books. No question. Who would dare to question that, Mr. Producer? <coughs> of course, there. she's written her own books. And uh, they are just so swell about lifestyle choices. Uh, and what does Michelle know about lifestyle choices? Nothing. But it doesn't matter. Her, her name is on the book, so it sells a ton. They like her over there at The View. I have no doubt about it. No doubt about that. And uh, she's with the in crowd. She's with the in crowd. And of course, they've been with Netflix. Netflix that's been in financial trouble a long time because they've developed their own TV programming, so to speak. Because the Obamas are very, very well-known TV producers and directors. And so they've made millions from doing that. Hollywood's taken very good care of the Obamas. What do they have? Five homes, including a Mathers Vineyard. and They have a home uh, somewhere else where they build a, a wall, you know, so that damn ocean wouldn't, you know, leach onto the property there. Spend a lot of money on landscaping. They don't, they don't want that kind of script to take place. No. And they give speeches. Oh, yeah, especially Barack. They figure he can't stop talking like Clinton, Bill Clinton, so we might as well pay him. And he goes, oh, he's paid a lot of money. And he deserves it. Of course he does. Deserves it. He's fantastic. Unbelievable. And so they're worth like a quarter of a billion dollars, the Obamas. They are extraordinary Marxist revolutionaries. They are extraordinary Alinskyites, are the Obamas. And so Michelle figured everything she touches turns into money. And so they got a great idea. Let's have a Michelle juice brand. Excuse me? Juice. What happened to the organic garden? Uh, excuse me. That was all a hoax. I mean, it, it, uh, it, it was destroyed. Of course, the Trumps did it. The, the, the Trumps destroyed it. Yes, yes. And so I'm looking here from Fox News. Former First Lady Michelle Obama's touted health drink, Plezi. P-L-E-Z-I. What does that mean? Plezi. Oh, what do I know? Would fail the health standards set by the Obama administration, a new Bloomberg report found. Oh, do tell. After discussing with 12 independent health professionals and organizations. 
The Bloomberg News Organization found that Plessy's current flavors released earlier this month would not meet the requirements to be served at elementary middle schools. Uh-oh. But do they make money? That's the issue. These Marxist revolutionaries need to know if they're going to make money off the drinks. At least it's not like Kool-Aid, you know. Remember Jim Jones, Mr. Producer, drink the Kool-Aid? Drink the Plessy. Under the Obama-era school meal regulations currently under review, U.S. elementary middle schools may only serve water, milk, or 100% fruit or vegetable juice with no added sweeteners. And the regulations do permit schools to dilute juices with water, and none of Plessy's four current flavors meet these criteria. According to the experts, there were, was concern over the, quote, non-nutritive. Non-nutri- oh, I feel like I'm being treated other way. Non-nutritive sweeteners in the drink, such as stevia leaf and monk fruit extracts, they could still be considered unhealthy. The World Health Organization previously published its own report on Monday advising against the use of sweeteners like stevia to control body weight. Now, I say this. I'm going to do something that's going to shock you. I'm going to come to the defense of Michelle Obama. I'm going to come to the defense because Michelle wants to fatten up the kids. And you know what I see here when she fattens up the kids, Mr. Producer? Membership fees. To Fatties United. Michelle Obama is... I'm going to announce this right now. I'm going to give her an honorary position at Fatties United or FU. Michelle Obama is... Perfect for FU, I would think. Nutrition experts are more critical of the former first lady for promoting a brand that may ultimately be a less healthy option. She has been ill served by advisors. Oh, those damn advisors. Who convinced her to start by targeting 6 to 12 year olds with a flashy, ultra processed beverage that may not be any healthier than diet soda, Gerald M- Manday, a nutrition professor, told Bloomberg. Oh, you're such a schmo, Gerald. You don't understand what's going on. The Center for Science and the Public Interest Nutrition Director, Bonnie Liebman, added, kids are also better off getting the intact fiber and fruit rather than the processed fiber added to flezzy. Plezzy. Plezzy, plezzy, floozy, whatever it is. Anyway, Michelle, welcome to FU. I'll be right back. You're listening to the Memorial Day edition of the Best of the Mark Levin Show. You know, there was some breaking news on my Sunday show on Fox. And apparently it wasn't breaking enough for the news. On the Constipated News Network and MSLSD? No. New York Slimes, Washington Compost? No, even my news colleagues, my buddies at my favorite network. None of them picked up on it, did they, Mr. Producer? Did you find that strange that nobody at all picked it up? How about any of the conservative news outlets? Did you see it on any of them, Mr. Producer? Not one. And we are the highest rated show on the weekends, most of the time, on Fox. Hopefully we will be tomorrow, too. But that said, no bragging, I'm just pointing it out. That's a big show. And you could tell, I think, Mr. Producer, when Brett Tolman, the former U.S. attorney from Utah, said what he said, that got my attention. I perked up a little bit. Because I actually listen to what my guests say before I'm trying to interrupt them. Now, I want you to listen to this. We can do it here. We have multiple platforms. I want you to listen to this. This is Brett Tolman, who was a U.S. attorney in Utah, really, really top lawyer. And he's very soft-spoken. So check it out. Cut 22, go. 
But you make a very good point. The U.S. attorney is nominated by the president, not the attorney general, and confirmed by the Senate. They are presidential appointees, and they serve at the pleasure of the president. So despite what the practices may be the last couple of decades, you're making the point, it's a very important point, that the U.S. attorney in Washington, D.C., I believe his name is Graves, that he has his own authority to act, that he doesn't have to sit around and worry about what the criminal division or the public integrity section or the U.S. attorney's office or the attorney general or anybody else has to say uh, to open an investigation at a minimum and to bring an indictment, correct? That's exactly right. He has all that authority. And I'll tell you something else that I, I've learned uh, relative to this. The outgoing U.S. attorney at the time of January 6th had identified a very small number of individuals that should be prosecuted <clears throat> and had indicated to DOJ that that was his intention. They forced him out because he did not have the same vision <clears throat> that they did in terms of what they would turn the January 6th prosecution into. And so I think about that and who they put in in their place, and it is someone that will toe the line and follow what Washington, D.C. wants. And, and, and that is the greatest injustice we have, because now we see that they will do make decisions and use their power to uh, based on politics rather than based on the facts and the evidence, which would result in a lot of people being prosecuted and put in jail, including the Biden family. Did you pick up on that, folks? The first Biden U.S. attorney was removed because he wouldn't go along with the program that Mr. Graves did go along with enthusiastically, which was to throw a very wide net to track down people all over the country who would not really committed serious crimes, you know, jaywalking type stuff. And... The Biden administration wanted to really brutalize these people. And I think try and harm uh, the MAGA movement, try and harm conservatives, try and harm Republicans, which they're still doing today. The greatest investigation in the history of the FBI. Are you kidding me? And he says the first U.S. attorney was pushed out because he wouldn't go for it. So they brought in this this hack. He also said, by the way, during the course of the program, that he would have already indicted the Bidens. They had absolutely no justification for the 20 shell companies. They had no business whatsoever behind these companies. And they had no reason to take the money from the communist Chinese or the Romanian government or front group. <clears throat> other than their names, other than to try and influence the vice president. And this all happened when Biden was vice president. He said there was more than enough to indict them. And if he had been the U.S. attorney in D.C., he would have indicted them. Now think about that. That's a big deal. In the meantime, the radical kook DA in Georgia has uh, said enough to enough people officially, of course, that <clears throat> the New York Times got the information, uh, which was then printed by other publications like the New York Post, if you will, uh, that the staff for the Fulton County DA, Fannie Willis, has been told to work remotely between July 31 and August 18, that she has requested judges in a downtown Atlanta courthouse not to schedule trials between August 7 and August 14, according to a letter to county officials. And so the implication is she's going to charge President Trump. So this is the next phase of the Democrat Party prosecutors uh, expanding their criminal attacks on Trump. So this has not gone away. This has been going on six or seven years now. It's not going to stop. And then the moron in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, the special counsel, he'll drop a shoe. How much you want to bet they're on communication about timing? How much you want to bet? Why wouldn't they be? 
There's no law against it, so what will stop them? Nothing. And then, unfortunately, <clears throat> we have people like Bill Barr and Ty Cobb, not the baseball player, but the goofball, you know, the walrus-looking guy. The latter was a lawyer for Trump, and he's running around saying, basically, that Trump's going to be charged on a document case. And almost gleefully, Bill Barr is doing the same thing. In fact, they're giving cover to the charges. They're urging the charges. They're encouraging the charges. And I'm going to tell you why. In the case of Bill Barr, he hangs out in the same circles as uh, as a number of these these lawyers who are so offended, you know, Andy McCarthy, same circles as Mike Ludig, same circles. Remember, he was first appointed by Old Man Bush to be the Attorney General, and that's okay. I'm just making a point. That's his social circle, and so he and the others are very, very troubled by the document case, you know. Needed to be criminalized, there needed to be a warrant, there needed to be a SWAT team, because God could only know what what Trump took and, and what he was going to do with the information, the former president, and as far as we know right now, he didn't do anything with it. Certainly nothing that damages or threatens the country. And then we have the the DA in Atlanta, Find me some votes. Ooh. Or the fake, quote unquote, electors. Now, she's a DA in Atlanta. Even if fake electors are an issue, that's not for a DA in Atlanta to handle. First of all, it's not for any DA to handle. It's not for any prosecutor to handle. But if you pretend that it is, what does it have to do with a DA in Atlanta? Nothing. And then you have the usual rhinos there who are all in. Yeah, yeah, I get them. You know, like Rafis, whatever the guy's name is. Long German name. Can't remember his name. Secretary of State and the former lieutenant governor. Yeah, yeah, let's get him. The Democrats don't have people like this. They don't have this problem in their party. Their party is like, like I say, it is a religious experience. Very poor one, by the way. I said, like Jim Jones, but it's a religious experience. They're not going to turn on their elders. No, no, not the elder generation. (laughs) We can't listen to them. We. We in the. What is this younger generation? What is it called, Mr. President? Do we even know? What name have they given it? Is this Gen X? I thought it was something else. Maybe it's the LGBTQ generation. Could it be? I don't know. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Now back to the best of Mark Levin. We honor those on Memorial Day who have given their lives to defend this nation. I'm going to say something I'm definitely not supposed to say. The likely, should I talk about the release date, Mr. Producer? Even though it hasn't been finalized, but I'm pretty sure it is. Don't be a quizzling. The likely release date is September 19th. I don't mean to undercut my team, but they know they know that to be the case. So that's the likely release date. I'll let you know if it's not. Nothing you can do about it on Amazon right now, but I'm extremely anxious to get this out. Extremely anxious for reasons that'll become clear when they need to become clear. But typically happens when I say something like that is everybody looks at their own books. We don't want it to come out the 19th. But anyway, uh, that's the plan. We shall see. Before we close out the program, I want to get to this from our uh, intrepid friends over at uh, Just the News, John Solomon's place, the house that John built. Prior to former President Trump, the Justice Department had not been involved in enforcing the Presidential Records Act. According to testimony from a National Archives and Records Administration official, 
I hope uh, Big Bill Barr is paying attention. Not that he matters. Not a, not that he cares, rather. On Wednesday, the House Intelligence Committee released a transcript from an interview in March with NARA officials in which the agency's chief operating officer, William Bosanko, testified the agency had, quote, found classified information in unclassified boxes, unquote, for all presidential administrations from Reagan forward. He also said the boxes of materials were in the archives custody at the time the agency made the discovery. However, Bosenko, who said he has worked for the agency for more than 30 years, also said he was not aware that the Department of Justice had any involvement with enforcing the Presidential Records Act prior to Trump. Former Vice President Pence and President Biden, all of whom were recently found of classified documents in their possession. In response to House Delegate Stacey Plasker, remember we despise her, Delegate U.S. Virgin Islands, question about DOJ providing guidance to new presidential administrations for following the Presidential Records Act, Bosanko said he was not aware of DOJ being involved in that. And then with no DOJ involvement in that, the next time the Department of Justice would be involved is at the end, if necessary, if there's a referral from an inspector general, etc., he said, to do an investigation or to enforce conditions of the Presidential Records Act. Correct? Plaskett asked Bosanko. Correct, he replied. I am not aware of any other instance where the Department of Justice has gotten involved in this. Representative Elise Stefanik asked Bosanko whether there had ever been another case in which he had, for any reason, referred any previous president or vice president to the agency's inspector general. Prior to the three instances that have just happened, he said no. Former National Security Council Senior Director Cash Patel told Just the News on Friday, NARA's lack of referrals until the Trump presidency demonstrates that equal application of law does not apply to Trump and those who served in his administration. He's right. He's right. So I wanted you to know this. Because if I don't tell you, nobody's going to. That's a big piece of information there. Big. Ladies and gentlemen, we salute our armed forces, police officers, firefighters, emergency personnel, our truckers, the men and women, the freedom fighters in Ukraine and Taiwan and around the rest of the world. And all of you, I wouldn't be here without you. And so I'm blessed to have you here. And I know it. And God bless each and every one of you, the smartest people of all audiences. 